Hey y'all, Rob here. So I'm in Blind River. I'm actually at the Blind River Cemetery. I'll explain to you why I'm here in a minute, but uh, I want to talk about what's behind me. It's a forest. I mean, one of the, my favorite things about the Blind River area is how lush and diverse the forest is. It's October, early October, and the fall colors are happening. And it's just a really beautiful area, so. Anyways, I come up to the graveyard just about every time I come to Blind River. And I come to Blind River probably seven or eight times a year. It's a hundred mile drive from uh, where I live now. Uh, my dad's family settled in here around just prior, I believe, just prior to World War I, possibly right after World War I. My grandfather, my dad's dad, he's from, uh, I, I believe he's from Michigan. Menominee, Michigan, or is it was yeah, that's Michigan. It's close to Wisconsin. Anyways, if you look, you know, I've done my family tree, and and a lot of people from France migrated through Maine and the southern part of the border between Canada and the U.S. And you know, his family would have settled in around around that area. You know, there's pockets of French people that settled in through that entire area. My dad's mother is from Quebec, so my dad's mother. And my dad's father married, I believe, just before World War I. They're, they're actually buried here. I'll show you their graveyard in a minute. Their gravestone. And uh, So my dad grew up in Blind River with uh, 12 siblings. There was a large French-Canadian family. And um, as a child, we, we actually lived here until I was three years old. And then uh, we moved to uh, Sudbury, where I have been ever since. And uh, my family to southern Ontario, so I'm the only guy left. I kind of like it up in Sudbury, so. Anyways, let's talk about the forest for a minute before I show you some gravestones. I just I just love the awesomeness of the forest. Check it out. It's just so mystical. And I'm reminded of uh, a pop quiz from years ago. I totally forgot about this, and uh, it's a really interesting conversation starter or conversation piece if you're talking to people. Uh, here's how it goes, from what I remember. So, I want you to uh, think of the first three things that come to mind, your first three animals that come to mind. So, the idea is, you write down, without thinking, just your first three animals or favorite animals, whatever comes to mind. And then you come up with, what are your first three things you think about when you think about the ocean? And what are the first three things that you think about when you think about the forest? So the idea is, is that whatever you say, when you come up with the three animals, the first animal you come up with is, is uh, how people see you, how, number two is how you see yourself, and number three is how you really are. I know it's kind of a pop quiz, but it's a lot of fun. There could be a lot of truth to it. I don't know. <laughs> I think when I did it, I did lion, otter, and Labrador retriever. I kind of look at myself as a Labrador retriever. How about you? Try it. And the second thing is, <coughs> excuse me, how do you, what, what are the first three, three things that come to mind when you think of uh, the ocean? So whatever those three are, words are, and it's the same idea, how, how you see the uh, sex from the outside, from the inside, and how you really are. So, so the ocean's got to do with sexuality. And the final one, the forest, is, you know, what are the three things you think about? When you think of the forest, the, and the forest represents death. So how you see death, how you uh, perceive death uh, socially or uh, consciously, unconsciously, and how you deeply, I don't know, something like that. It's fun. Try it out. It's a whole lot of fun. You might be able to Google that pop quiz. So anyways, yeah, the forest is one of my favorite places. Uh, you know how people like to build homes near water? And they like to take pictures near water? I always thought... To me, the ultimate would be to be in a home right in the forest. That would be the ultimate. Unbelievable. Anyway, so I'm here to do a family photo in a set of falls. I've, uh, I've done a few photo shoots here before at Lake Lozon Lodge. There's a, uh, Lake Lozon is a beautiful lake. Lake Lozon Lodge is on the highway on the lake there's a creek that runs from the lake to the uh, lake lake huron which is not just literally two miles or a mile that way blind river is on lake huron 
And uh, so I'm going to be doing a family photo. So I'm going to show you some of that later once I get set up for that. Uh, last time I was here was photographing a wedding there, some families. The first time I came and did a family there, I was with the, the red couch. And uh, it was a really cool shoot. So anyways, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, what else was I going to say about that? It's one of my favorite places. So my cousin Mark, he's the same age as I am. Mark's mom and my mom married two brothers, my dad and my uncle Henry. My dad and my uncle Henry were a year apart, and they grew up uh, literally as the two closest siblings in the big family of 13. And my uncle Henry is still alive. He's uh, about 86 years old. He lives in Blind River with my Aunt Mary, who was my mom's best friend before they met and married these brothers back in the 50s. And uh, so I got a lot of memories, a lot, a lot of memories, a lot of fond memories of Blind River. And uh, there's more to it, and, and uh, I'll share that in a minute. Let me, let me just show you something really interesting here. This, I think, is cool. My wife's family's from Blind River. My, my wife's mom. Check this out. I'm going to flip the camera around. Okay? That is my wife Tina's grandma. So my mother-in-law's mom, Bertha. I remember Bertha because I married Tina in 1996 and Bertha passed away in 2003, June 12th. So Bertha is from Blind River. She had married this guy, Dollard, and he passed away in 1954. And she remarried two more times. So when I met her, uh, she was a widow for her third time. and. I don't think she had any, I don't think she had any uh, aspirations to get married again. So anyway, she was a beautiful lady and uh, French Canadian, just like my grandma, like my mamere from Blind River. So I have a lot of fond memories, a lot of fond memories of uh, Blind River. Many, many more than I do from my mom's side. My mom's side's from uh, Nova Scotia, Andy Kinnis, Nova, Nova Scotia. And um, I, uh, you know, we didn't have many opportunities because it was a hell of a drive. But Blind River, we used to come here all the time as children. Cousins, so many cousins, so many memories, and uh, aunts and uncles, and, and a lot of, uh, lot of love, a lot of uh, family activities, and uh, parties, and weddings, and anniversaries, and stuff. A lot of beer, too. Beer and players playing. All right, let me show you something else right here. Here we go. So these two cedar trees were planted by my uncle Phil, who was a uh, florist in town here. Most of my uncles had their own business as well as did my uh, my grandfather. No, there's my grandfather. His name is Nestor. He was born in 1896. There's my grandmother, my mamere. She was born in 1898. She died in 1993. He died in 1972. I was 14 years old when he died. And uh, there's my Uncle Hen uh not Henry, sorry, this is my Uncle Freddie. He's the oldest boy in the family. He, uh, he died in 2005. He served uh, in the Canadian Navy on a uh, ship called the Cape Breton, HMS Cape Breton, which was a frigate, which was uh, in protection of the uh, convoys that used to go, go across to Murmansk, Russia. They were delivering goods to Russia. And uh, they had to protect the convoys from the U-boats, and uh, my uncle, uh, Uncle Freddy, was uh, one of them. There's my uh, my dad's sister Claire, and my uncle Tom. So yeah, a lot of family, but more interesting, and most interesting. It looks like somebody is trimming the cedars there. See that? It's a pile of cedar cedar cuts. I don't know if you find any of this interesting, but I find graveyards fascinating, especially my family graveyard. You know, I'm not obsessed with death or anything like that. I'm, obs I'm more kind of like, I find history to be very poignant. And uh, I find as I get older, I have a lot of a lot of memories that come streaming back from my youth. And they, 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 they kind of get it put into a pers different perspective as you get older. And you think back to... Uh, uh, all of the uh, memories you have and all the wonderful times and largely uh, that and 
Let me show you this here. Check this out. It's my uh, my my mamere, my grandmother's sister. She's buried here, and this I believe was my grandmother's mom, as well as uh, I don't know somebody else. Bijou. My my grandmother, my mamere, was a, a Bijou. That was her maiden name. But check this out right here. This here is a grave marker. It says Baby Provence, born in nine, um, born and died in 1957. That was my mom and dad's baby, <clears throat> baby, what would have been my oldest brother. My mom and dad were uh, newlyweds. My mom was eight months pregnant, which would, would have been their first baby, but they had a head-on collision about an hour east of Blind River, coming back from a wedding, and uh, my dad almost died. He came very close to dying. My mom uh, lost her baby, and that's him. Now, I only found out about that particular marker about 10 years ago. My mom, I remember my mom had mentioned to me once that, you know, there's a marker there. What would have been your older brother? Uh, I have no idea. You know, people never talked about stuff like that. You know, the tragedies and uh, stuff like, uh, you know, if anybody got pregnant and had a baby out of wedlock, that kind of stuff was sort of kept under wraps. As well as, uh, you know, the experiences that my Uncle Freddie had in World War II. He never said a word. I remember he always had a picture of the boat he was on. And he seemed to have some fond connections, some fond memories. And it was, for him, kind of poignant. So, anyways, yeah, fascinating. So, the other reason I like graves and cemeteries is because of the historical context. Uh, 10, 11 years ago, my wife and my daughter and I, we went to France and I told my wife, she always wanted to go back. She had been with her mom and our daughter a few years prior. I said, okay, I'll, well, let's go to Paris. And But I said, we got to do at least a week checking out all the uh, World War II and World War I historical sites, which we did. And uh, man, it was amazing so amazing I want to go back one day and just spend even more time so but you know if you go to a, c a cemetery you can find out uh, sort of the history I find it fascinating you think of all the lives you look at stuff like this here okay there's I can spot a an army gravestone a mile away so this guy was a private Lake Superior Regiment he died in 1988 at age 75. So he was obviously in World War II. And you've got these wooden crosses. I can't even make out what that says. It looks like that person died in 1990-something. They were born in 1939. Interesting. And uh, when, you, when you go to any graveyard, virtually anywhere in North America, you will find... So I don't know about the U.S. They probably have the same thing. But, you know, this is part of the, uh, I don't know if it's the Legion or who who gives out the, the, something related to the government and all of the people who were uh, participants in World War II and World War I. And uh, this one here was MED, Stewardess Merchant Navy. I'm not sure if that's a name. So this guy died in uh, 1976. He was 68 years old. I'm not sure if that's World War One or Two because of his age. Now my grandfather, Nestor, the guy you saw over there with the two cedar trees, uh, he was in World War One. I've got to tell you a little story about him, and then uh, talk a little bit about some success strategies and kind of tie it into cemeteries. Uh, he moved to Canada before World War I. Apparently, this is the story I'm told. He, uh, you know, the Canadians signed up as combatants early, much earlier than the U.S. did, because they were affiliated with the, the U.K., and the U.K. declared war, 
and uh, so Canada declared war shortly thereafter, both in World War One and World War Two. And my grandfather tried to get in the army. For some reason, he couldn't. I'm not sure if it was a medical reason, but anyways, what he did was eventually he just said, "Okay, I'm going to go down to Michigan," and he signed up with uh, the American Army because he was an American by by birth and uh, been living in Canada with my my mamere. And he uh, he fought. I don't know what he did. I don't know anything about it. There's, I remember growing up, there were some amazing pictures. You know those army pictures, the long panoramas, black and whites? I have no idea where any of those or any of his medals are gone. It would be so cool to find those. So I do know one thing that his captain was Captain McDonald, I believe. And the McDonald's in Michigan have a big dairy farm, I believe. Same family. That's what I'm told. So, anyways, a little bit of history for all you there, and I'm looking around, I can see, I can see different markers for uh, different times and different armies, it's kind of interesting, so, when I went to uh, France and Belgium 10, 11 years ago with my wife and daughter, one of the most, I, ha I had, there's so many graveyards, it's the coolest thing, okay, you're in Belgium, World War I, all around the, uh, Passchendaele area and that, all over. You'd be driving around. I remember taking a drive one afternoon. My wife and daughter went shopping. I said, well, I'll go for a ride by myself. And all of a sudden, you'd be in this neighborhood, and boom, there'd be a uh, graveyard, or a, yeah, graveyard, right there, right next to a neighborhood, you know? And then, or you'd be driving down a secondary highway, and there'd be a grave, a cemetery in the middle of a, a field, a farmer's field. See, the Commonwealth and other uh, countries took care of these graves. So wherever there were first aid stations back in World War I, that's where the cemeteries were because it made sense, right? So it was kind of cool to stop and go visit all these different sites. However, the one that touched me the most was the Dieppe uh, Canadian Cemetery. Uh, I literally, I cried when I was there. It was just so heartbreaking. For those who don't know about the Dieppe raid, uh, it was kind of, they called it sort of a test raid to see how things would go uh, if they were to uh, land a bunch of soldiers on the beach in France, occupied France. I, I forget when it was, 1941 or something like that. It was a catastrophe. It was a disaster, an absolute disaster. So, so the Canadians were the ones that landed almost 900 Canadians got mowed down on the beach and killed and they're all buried there in uh, the cemetery so you just go there and you see this massive cemetery a row upon row upon row that many that many all at the same date they all died the same day so anyways that's my fascination with graveyards it's not too morbid I don't think it is anyways and I like to come here and pay my respects to my family and uh, reminisce a little bit so Anyways, but we're here because we're alive, and uh, life is for the living. And it reminds me of uh, this idea that, you know, we live in a day and age when I think we've lost our way, for many of us, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, depression, anxiety, there's a lot of medication. And there's a lot of, uh, I don't want to sound mean or anything like that, but, you know, we tend to deny the truth and reality. Instead, we look for an easy solution. We look for dopamine hits. We look for a pill. Just pop a pill and everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. However, we're living in denial. When we take any route, that's the easy road. So... My suggestion to you and to everybody who's listening is to face the fears, face the demon, face the dragon, do battle with your inner demons. And if you're, if you're struggling through anxiety and depression, if you're struggling with anything that is uh, holding you back, don't look 
for external solutions. Take this piece of advice. Maybe, just maybe, and I think personally this is true, maybe you're not living your true, authentic, passionate flow, your own path, that once you do that, a large part of those afflictions go away. They're manageable. You discover your true self. So I think that if you're searching for the easy road, dopamine hits through shopping, drinking, drugging, pornography, or whatever neurotic behavior you might be afflicted with, the more you're doing that, the more you're getting away from your true authentic self. Once you tap into your true authentic self, once you follow your bliss, the way Joseph Campbell would say it, then you start the true journey and a large part of those behaviors go away. It's a neurosis, really. I think it was Virginia Sertier who said, all neurosis is a legitimate substitute for suffering or pain. At its root, there's a trauma. And the only way, the only way, is to face it dead on. There's no, there's no uh, other way. There's no easy road, so... Kind of deep, I know. I hope you've enjoyed this little tour. And uh, I'm just looking down at the ground. It looks like bear poop. <laughs> We're literally right against the forest, so yeah, wouldn't be surprised if it was a bear. So um, I'm going to now show you the family and explain some technical stuff. So. All right, guys. Talk to you later. All right, I'm back, and I lied. I said I was gonna start showing you some of the uh, setup and whatnot for the uh, family shoot that I'm here to photograph, but I got distracted, and I want to talk a little bit about business and sort of my history on business. So let me show you this here. You can see that it's Provence Lane after my family who settled here, like I mentioned earlier, in uh, just before or just after World War I. My papere, my grandfather from Michigan, and my mamere, my grandmother from Quebec. So my dad grew up here, met my mom here back in the 50s. There's 13 in the family, big Catholic family. So my grandfather and his brother were in business together. That's what brought him here. They were, uh, they had a, uh, a farm north of here and they uh, slaughtered cows and so they were butchers so to speak and they had an abattoir and they supplied meat to all the different lumber camps. A lot of lumbering went on in this area, a lot of pine trees. I think they had the largest pine tree lumbering business in uh, North America at one time. So there's there. And uh, I'll throw my garbage out here. There's a there's a, a bear proof receptacle in uh, downtown Blind River. So yeah, let me talk a little bit about business before I show you the family shoot setup. I know this has been long. Bear with me. I hope it's uh, entertaining and worth your time so yeah i love visiting the have you ever been to your your old neighborhood after having left there decades later i remember doing that back in the 90s i had not been to my old neighborhood in sudbury since whenever <laughs> and I, i've heard this from people before everything was so much smaller than what i remember it I guess everything is much bigger when you're uh, a child. So I have a, a lot of memories visiting and going up this river. It goes all the way up to Lake Deborn. My cousin and I used to get in his 9.9 .9 horsepower boat and we'd go fishing, we'd go water skiing, we'd go fishing at night, catching bar butts. And one thing I remember is this is the, the main street, but this is the back of main street. Main street's on the other side. And there was a sign right there 
that said People's Lunch. People's Lunch was my dad's business. He uh, started that with my Uncle Johnny. And um, that was probably in the late 50s. Uh, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know if he the business went under or he might have declared bankruptcy I don't know but something happened and he picked up my mom and my three sisters at the time because my fourth sister the baby Suzanne was born in Sudbury but myself and my three other sisters I have four younger sisters than I and uh, he moved us to Sudbury I think he was escaping anyways doesn't matter I uh grew up around my dad, my grandfather, all my uncles. Uh, they were all pretty much self-employed. So I mentioned this a couple of years ago when I was at Maggie's studio in uh, Oakville, when I had the one day marketing summit. I showed a picture of my grandfather pre-World War I with his brother. They're standing there with some other random dude in their butcher shop. And uh, I was talking about how I feel very fortunate that I was surrounded by and immersed in business, business mindset. I used to hear stuff, talk about business all the time. Stuff like there are no partners in business, and uh, which is true. Partnerships are really, really hard. Doesn't mean it's impossible. You talk about guys like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, and you talk about guys like Walt Disney and his brother Roy. Those were partnerships, but when a par partnership works, there's usually completely diametrically opposed roles. If you're doing the same thing, it's not going to work. I've seen many, many instances of many families fall apart, create lifelong uh, resentments and hatreds for one another because they got into business together. So, so you see that business, Algoma Center right behind me? That was my Uncle Henry's hardware store for many, many years. And uh, something my Uncle Henry used to say all the time was clean the sidewalk or sweep the sidewalk. He uh, was one of you know many uncles that had their own business and uh, ran it very, very successfully for many, many years. Let me show you this here. Hold on. This is downtown Blind River. And I remember visiting here many, many times in my youth. This used to be called the Harmonic, which was a local drinking establishment, and they always had bands. So uh, I used to hear that from my uncles, and uh, the idea of being in business for myself was something that was something that uh, was natural for me. And uh, I think it's important if you don't have that, if you grew up, say, maybe your parents were blue-collar workers, plumbers, or whatever, it's uh, there's a, there's a real easy hack and a workaround, and uh, they're just really called books or tapes or books on tape. So I highly recommend that you read books by well-known and established business people, you know, like Sam Walton. There's a really good book about him. Uh, Virgin, what's his name? The guy from Virgin Airways, Virgin Records. You know the dude. So, anyways, that's the downtown of Blind River, Ontario. The town that I was born in in 1958. I lived here for three and a half years. I remember going there when I was a little kid, getting my, you know, my shots. And uh, so you can instill and integrate a business mindset. I find a lot of people get want to be in business for themselves, but they get lost because they get too, they get what's called technitis. See that restaurant there? It's called the 17. It was run by a Chinese family. I think maybe it still is. I don't know. But I remember going there in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And uh, it was a Chinese family. I mean, those those were people that migrated to Canada back in the 50s, like they did all over North America. They escaped the whole 
communist revolution back then in the 50s and 60s and, and they wanted to start a new life and man those people worked hard truly they worked hard you know you have a different perspective when survival is the name of the game you're hungry I think Arnold Schwarzenegger used to say that all the time you got to be hungry if you're not hungry you're not gonna wanna work hard and pursue your ambitions okay, I'm just gonna show you one more thing and then I'm gonna close off this is the bridge highway 17 over there is Lake Huron and this is Blind River. The reason they call it Blind River is because they dammed it. This bridge I'm on is right beside the dam. And they dammed it a long, long time ago. And the river just sort of started to swerve and swerve and go all over the place. And uh, my Uncle Henry lives right there, right now. That park, that land right there was owned by my, uh, my grandfather. And he had his sort of a general store slash meat market there. And uh, sometime in the 70s, it burned down. So I don't know if you can see that right there. See that park bench? That's a commemorative bench for my Uncle Henry, the guy who was showing you. I was showing you his grave marker who served in the Canadian Navy in the uh, frigate protecting the convoys against the U-boat attacks in the North Atlantic. So, All right, guys. I promise this time I'm going to show you some family photography stuff. See you in a bit. Hey, Rob here. So I'm at the location where we're going to do the family shoot. I don't know if I'll have enough time to shoot some actual video because I'm kind of flying solo without an assistant and what have you. But uh, I'll give you some tech and I'll show you the location. I'm shooting with my trusted Sony A7R2. Um, I'm probably going to use the 55 mil or the 16 to 35 at 35 for the first location, and I'll show you why in a minute. Second location, I'm going to try and use the 135. If I can't get away with the 135, I'm going to use the 85. I'm hoping to get away with the 135, and again, I'll show you in a minute. So I just talked to the mom. It's 5 to 3 right now. She's showing up with her husband and their four kids. She looks amazing. She uh, she looks like she's 22 years old, but she's 38. She's had four kids. She looks absolutely stunning. And uh, the kids are 8, eight, 10, 11, and 12 or something like that. So they're good ages because, you know, you get those younger kids. They're hard to manage. Can you hear that? That's the sound of the falls where we're going to. So I'm going to give you a lay, a lay of the land here so there's a dam here which controls the water outflow from Lake Lozon to Lozon Creek I don't know if it's spring or fall but the salmon from Lake Huron comes up here and spawns so you'll see this creek will be filled with fish. I just can't remember if it's spring or fall. It's a little tricky to get to, so I should have gone the other way. I've been here many, many times. you think I would have known better. Weather's perfect. It's a uh, slight chance of rain. It's overcast. It's not very cold. And uh, very little wind, if any. So I'm going to show you the dam. But that's the opening to Lake Lozon. There's the dam. So I'm going to be shooting for the first shoot from up here, on top of the dam. And I'm going to shoot down there. Now I've done families here before. And I've done uh, a wedding here before. I posed the whole bridal party right there. So, now here's the thing.
right there, light source, right? That's my light source. So I'm thinking I won't have to use the Godox to illuminate that. Now I'm going to be shooting down on there. And uh, again, I don't know if I'm going to be using the 55 or the 16 to 35 G Master at 35. If, if I have to use the wide angle zoom, I'm going to try and shoot it at 35 mil. The reason, obviously, is to get enough, uh, you know, I'm kind of limited because I'm on a dam. I can't go back that way because I'll, I'll end up in the water. Anyways, when they show up, we'll make that decision. So that's the plan. Posing them down there. Shooting from up there. Now, the second location, what I'm going to do is when I get them uh, set up there, I'm going to have them spin around 180 degrees. And uh, I'm going to walk over here and switch lenses, hopefully the 135. Which I love that lens for, uh, it's got such a cinematic look. I was thinking too, I might, you know, I might do one picture right on this trail if they want some fall colors. But when I was talking to the mom just a little while ago, I, I said we're going to go by the falls, by the water, by the creek here. She said, oh, I love that place. It's my favorite place. So I, I may not go with the second location. I may just keep them in the water. So you can see here, check this out. Fishing. Catch anything? Sorry, I scared you. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna position them right there, and uh, I might shoot from over here. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to startle you. What are you fishing for? Is the salmon running now? Is your name Jim? Okay. I thought it was Jim. I didn't think his name was Jim. I just thought I'd get the conversation going. Okay, so. So if I'm shooting from here, I might go back to that bridge over there. See that bridge? I might shoot from the bridge. Or I might shoot from these rocks. Because these rocks kind of, they jut out. And if I'm shooting from here with the long... See? That's the area that I'll have them in. Now, I've done pictures there before. You might have seen them. So, Anyways, we'll talk to you guys later. And we're at the falls. Say hi. So we got... My assistant, this is what a lodge owner looks like.